Um, I, I did indeed uh, meet with uh, Janet and David quite early on uh, in my time uh, uh, at um, uh, the British Library around in, in September. And uh, it was their suggestion that, though I'll say a few words today, that roam quite widely uh, across all the big issues that, that everyone in this room and beyond is, is facing, uh, it might make sense for me to tie that back uh, to some of my experiences at the BBC um, uh, not least because I think there's something about uh, uh, retaining a bit of identity, even two months in as a semi-outsider here. There's a lot of ingrained knowledge and depth in this room. Um, but I think part of the energy I hope that I can help bring out with colleagues is both sympathetic questioning and, and experience from another, another sector, while at the same time going on this astonishing uh, journey of, uh, uh, of discovery of course. Um, uh, now, it is fair to say that since I met with Janet and David, it's been an event-filled few weeks uh, at the BBC, and I did begin to think, is, is that still a good idea? And then I thought, yes, it definitely is, uh, for two reasons. One, if we leave it until the next conference, then I'll have forgotten it all and have gone native. Uh, and two, I think, genuinely, at times like this, it is very, very good to refer occasionally to the British Broadcasting Corporation uh, in ways that remind us of its importance to culture uh, and British life, because sometimes in a storm like this, it's easy to forget all of that. Um, so there's a little bit of that uh, in the background. Um, I guess the very fact that I'm standing here with all of you today is evidence, uh, a measure of the extent to which in the digital age, the edges between industries, disciplines, ideas, job descriptions tend to get blurred uh, and mingled. Uh, I think we've all felt this in different ways, and it can be destabilizing, it, it, it can be exciting. Um, and in a way, my own journey of, of uh, experiencing that uh, was reflected in time, inside my time at the BBC. I, it's absolutely right. I spent much of my time thinking about uh, television programmes, traditional broadcasting, uh, uh, what you might call the core 20th century business of the BBC. Um, but all the time, I think many of us were reflecting as the digital revolution kicked in, that something else was growing up alongside the traditional models that could either threaten what an institution like that does or transform it and make it deeper and better and more and more uh, interesting. And uh, I had long been preoccupied by what the BBC we call the archive, and it is, a, there is a written archive in the traditional sense, it's really a programme library, is, is what they genuinely tend to mean by that. And uh, uh, back in the 90s, we'd begun to find ways to do more with it in the age of, of just multi-channel television, but it became blindingly clear as uh, the power of the web and connected media kicked in, that the BBC, in addition to being an astonishing live broadcaster, was also accumulating daily, hourly, minute by minute, a vast searchable resource of content, which even if we hadn't cleared the rights or wired it up or published it uh, or given it the metadata to make it usable, nonetheless was acquiring that potential and most importantly in the eyes of audiences in the UK and around the world an expectation was growing uh, that we should do more with it and it was that insight really four years ago Mark Thompson myself and a few others um, that led to the uh, uh, the creation of the last job I did at the BBC and all the various initiatives that began then and which I sincerely hope will continue and, and indeed uh, uh, I'm keeping an eye on some of them um, from, uh, from up the road. And uh, one of the, the things that happened over that period was this, this archive of the BBC, um, which in, in some senses uh, was a, uh, it was Sarah Hayes who, who, who looked after the assets, so always described it as a working archive. It's a, it's a sort of research library, if you like, for the producers and researchers of the BBC. It's used uh, uh, plundered, explored, uh, digested, and sometimes reworked. But increasingly, 
it was becoming the center of the whole ecosystem of the organization. Uh, we're creating an end-to-end -end digital BBC uh, in which this thing we used to call the archive simply is the living library of content which increasingly gets exposed. So it began to move center stage. And as it did, we found ourselves asking big, new strategic questions which turned out to be remarkably similar to some of the questions that the great memory institutions and cultural institutions were asking to the BFI, obviously, the British Library, uh, and three years ago this December, next month, uh, um, we signed a, a strategic agreement with Lynn and colleagues for the BBC and the British Library to, uh, to work together. And I guess it was that coming together uh, that has led me to be here today, because in the end it turned out that there was one huge project that connected all sorts of different people, institutions, uh, and activities. So what I'm going to do as I move through uh, some thoughts now is really pick up on a handful, five or six, of the big themes that we were thinking about, uh, BBC still is thinking about, uh, and which I think match very well, connect with, and stimulate a lot of the ideas in, in here, thank you, which I think is an extremely, extremely lucid and, and helpful way to set out uh, uh, the issues we all face, uh, and indeed some of the, the, the strategic objectives of the library. Um, first, we found a huge, exciting pressure to explore ideas around openness and what you might call public space or digital public space. Uh, um, and that, uh, that, that's a set of ideas that can express themselves in many, many ways. Well, I'm sure we'll be talking a lot about open access <laughs> uh, over the next few days. But, but the, the openness and connectivity, it feels like an irreversible force. Um, at the BBC, we were looking to make ourselves better connected digitally with other institutions, other databases, other catalogues, so that as we... Uh, digitized content there, it can be discovered and connected with other, other great uh, uh, institutional sets. At the British Library, um, there is language there of being a trusted hub in the global information economy. Uh, and as I was working my way into the library, uh, I looked at that language. I thought, what, what does that really mean, a hub? It's an odd word. Is that really right? Um, and living there for two months, I begin to feel in several different ways what that means. A, a, a library, I suspect of any kind, certainly the one that I've, I've the privilege and responsibility of working in and with, uh, is an intersection of dozens of different worlds. It is a great public space in that, say, in that sense, where one has a sense of meeting and convening um, across different communities. Higher education and the research community, fundamentally, of course. Uh, the legal deposit libraries, uh, including the national libraries, all of whom represented here today, of course. The culture and heritage sector, the museum sector, uh, the arts institutions. Uh, increasingly, the media sector, BFI, media companies, news organizations that we work with. The publishing industry, not just the academic journal publishing industry, the mainstream industry, and indeed the explosion of publication of all kinds, as we're discovering with non-print legal deposit, everyone is a publisher these days. Even that Twitter feed has a lasting value and is a form of individual publication. Um, business, startups, the general public, uh, clearly coming from the BBC, the general public loom large. Uh, no less, and I'm thrilled to see in the, the, uh, the, the strategic objectives that Lynn bequeathed to the British Library, uh, a commitment to enable access to anyone who wants to do research. Anyone who wants to do research. A very, very powerful little word to put in that sentence. Very demanding. Uh, and I think it's an aspiration. Uh, but I feel a responsibility, and I think we can only do this together, to open up the tools of research wider and wider uh, as digital design, digital architecture gets better and better. And that happens in many ways, but I was delighted uh, yesterday, one of our, our communities that we serve is the startup business community. Uh, we have a business and IP center in London that uses some of the British libraries, obviously we're a patent library, but also the, the, the intellectual property expertise we have. Uh, yesterday, I was thrilled to uh, be able to sign the document 
that begins to roll out a version of that uh, to, uh, to Leeds, to Sheffield, Birmingham, Liverpool, Manchester, and indeed just down the road uh, in Newcastle uh, Public Library. I was checking the current version of it now. Uh, and that sense of um, people, a wholly different community from the ones we tend to serve in the academic space, but nonetheless smart, intelligent people who need to be guided through huge data sets of information uh, to find what they need. And within that general realm of what you might call public space, certainly at the BBC, um, uh, the BBC often used the language of guaranteeing access. Uh, the, it, it, the license fee buys a sense within a wholly commercialized media domain of there being a guarantee of a certain amount of free access to high quality content day in, day out. And again, very, very struck to find as I step uh, into uh, Sandy Wilson's astonishing building at St Pancras uh, that the commitment to guarantee access to future generations is baked into the strategic plan of the British Library. Again, it's like the anyone where guarantee is a very, very strong word. Uh, it's very difficult to do. Um, we found at the BBC there are always gatekeepers, intermediaries, other people in whose interest, you know, it's a free world, is to, to make that value chain more complex, to intersect themselves, to either add value or interpose. Uh, and we need to work with them, we need to partner with them, but nonetheless, it's a demanding vision to guarantee access and for future generations. This is an open-ended commitment and something I'm still digesting uh, uh, and reflecting on and would love to come back and, and discuss and talk in, in, in future sessions like this, is how we maintain that guarantee of permanence uh, in an age of digital preservation as well as physical preservation. This is really unfinished business and, and, and immature uh, technology. So openness and public space. Second set of themes, uh, um, uh, which I partly comes, I guess, from my time uh, uh, involved in charter renewal at the BBC. Ten years ago, um, we began the process of, uh, uh, of, of the intellectual framework uh, for the next, uh, for what is currently the charter of the BBC. And we thought hard then uh, about purposes and identity um, for a big, a, a big, a great institution of that kind. And it has multiple identities, of course, but there was uh, uh, an in, uh, among the interesting debates was whether, for instance, at the BBC, it is fundamentally a provider of news and what you might call citizenship value, accurate uh, uh, reporting, or is it a great cultural institution as it is there to, to add to, to, to culture? And of course, you may expect me to say this, uh, I would say it is both. It has to be both. And indeed, it's, it's, the, it's the indivisibility uh, that gives it its unique character and strength. And again, I'm fascinated by the reads across uh, into the world I find myself stepping into because people ask me sometimes, the British Library, is that a research library or is it a cultural institution? Uh, and I'm afraid I give the boring answer. It is clearly wonderfully and gloriously both and it's a better research library for being and you get the idea, both ways. And I, 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 this was brought vividly to life for me by uh, actually meeting Rick Trainer at uh, King's just last week, um, who spontaneously and adamantly said his university is a cultural institution. It's a great, great university. It's a great, great cultural institution. And therefore, I, I, I'm not going to allow any contradiction here, I, I, I will be working with the team to develop um, these identities in tandem and constantly look for the explosions of creativity where they come together. But clearly, in this community, in higher education, uh, in the relationship both with the universities, the institutes of learning, the libraries that sit within those institutions, the British Library has an historic and enduring role to play. Um, I'm struck, again, as an outsider learning this environment, first of all, by some of the strength of the library's relationship here, both with the funding, with the research councils. We are an independent research organization for arts and uh, humanities. Very strong relationships with, with, with this organization, Universities UK. Uh, I saw Martin Harrow from JISC. Uh, and in these, these encounters, one thing that I observe, which again is 
is an echo of phenomena I've seen in, in the industry I'm coming away from, is very profound pressure of change. You must all feel it in, in your institutions. Uh, the, the business models for universities seem to be transforming in front of our eyes. You're getting more, more competition, diversity uh, of income, variation in, in wealth, uh, variation in strategy, what even what these institutions are for. Um, uh, true in the production sector, all sorts of other areas. But it is at times like that that uh, if things go well, other things happen as well, which are the, the pan-sector interventions. Those interventions that join people up need to get stronger as well, because you, you want diversity on the one hand, but to get smarter and smarter at finding those systemic interventions that really make the difference. Uh, and clearly some of the institutions I've named, including this one, uh, are, are great actors uh, in that activity. Um, but the British Library has itself a, a role to play, we think, right across the sector, uh, supporting, if we can, in many, many different ways, a special responsibility, I suspect, uh, for postgraduates or early career researchers, uh, and indeed relevant to the debate over culture. I think the library, though we pride ourselves on being open for research or a gateway for research across all fields, nonetheless, in the area of arts and humanities, there's such strength in depth, both in collections and, uh, and expertise, that the library's role in, I hope, many, many different ways in supporting the quality, impact, visibility, uh, and just uh, 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 excitement around arts and humanities research seems to be a big, big, big part of, of what we can do there. And when one talks language like that, the library's role as a cultural institution really comes into exciting relief for me. Um, we just opened uh, the uh, Mughal India exhibition in London with an accompanying, uh, a, an accompanying book. It is an exhibition of great beauty. Uh, it leverages, of course, the astonishing holdings uh, of the British Library, uh, but it's also a work of primary scholarship and research. Uh, that was especially true of the Royal Manuscripts collection uh, exhibition that took place this time last year. Uh, Arts and Humanities uh, 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 Research Council funded a great deal of work so that what was presented to the public was not just a selection of material, but a brand new narrative and a brand new set of, of uh, connections. Uh, and we're working in our public exhibitions and events programs, always to do that if we can, whether it's Magna Carta or even exploring popular culture connections like uh, uh, the, comic, uh, the comics exhibition, which will be coming next year. Behind the scenes, though, it gets even more exciting uh, for me. And again, these are, these are worlds that I'm only just uncovering, but they're very resonant to me coming from one creative organization uh, to discover that I'm stepping into, in its way, an equally creative organization. Because particularly around arts and humanities, but actually in all sorts of areas, um, the work that uh, Caroline Brazier's team and others have been doing in digital scholarship, in alliance frequently with university departments and other teams across the country, um, seems to me to be opening up cultural and scholarly value of wholly new kinds. And frequently, of course, for us, um, this builds on, and I will you know, touch, I think, on, on all of the, of, the, of the five aims that RLUK have set up. Um, but let's first of all think about that role of promoting unique and distinctive collections. The library has them, but what you can do with them now that you couldn't do 15 years ago is eye-opening and feels like just the beginning of a journey. Uh, there's probably too, too many to mention, but ones that have caught my eye, including the work that's been done uh, with Peter Barber and his teams on, on maps. I think just this week we're coming to the, 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 the second wave of crowdsourcing, geo-referencing for historic maps, where we're opening we're digital copies up there and opening it up to the community to tie these maps in, they have to be of just sufficient level of accuracy if you'd be able to link them to Google, but of course they're not completely accurate and you need work, individual knowledge to do it. Um, and we did a first wave, I think, a few months ago, uh, and in five days flat, we got 98% accurate geo-referencing for 724 different maps. Uh, and it, all, it was all very busy because everybody competed with everybody else, so you had a bit of energy, it was time-capped. 
Uh, um, but it really, really worked. We're doing it again, and we were just saying this is this should just become a rolling program now. We'll get better at it, uh, and uh, you build up whole new data sets out of what was just once, uh, 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 and still is gloriously, a piece of paper. Um, music, the uh, library has remarkable early music collections. I'm sure some of you uh, will know about early music online, uh, um, where 300 volumes uh, of historic sheet music, including something like half of our great 16th century anthologies, uh, are now online. We work with Royal Holloway on this. Um, they can link now to the audio record, uh, where there are sound recordings you can link, and we're working on OCR method, methods that can draw out the, the musical annotation, um, so that, again, uh, a unique, distinctive collection becomes data, not just in a traditional sense, but manipulatable uh, in new ways. Uh, and, and fascinatingly and uh, most intriguingly, uh, to cite one other example, uh, is our collecting of, um, of personal archives, again, uh, I take a keen interest in this from some of the arts programs I've made in the past. The library has been very smart in acquiring the works of J.G. Ballard, Harold Pinter, uh, but most recently Wendy Cope, who uh, um, uh, some of you will know, uh, has deposited with the library a personal archive, which is on the one hand 15 cardboard boxes of her manuscripts, notes, letters and fine, and broadly we know what to do with those. Um, she's also deposited 40,000 emails and other bits of digital material where even the smartest people at the library seem to be scratching their heads. They, just, they love this stuff, but nonetheless it's difficult because both to correlate that, to make it coherent as a collection, but also in the case of a large, important personal email collection like that and digital collection, it raises all manner of collecting issues, uh, how you surface it, how you, what, what kind of data you add to it, even how you read it, uh, and there's expertise, of course, which some of you will be properly familiar with, uh, that I don't fully understand about how you replicate original interfaces. What kind of drop-down menu would Wendy have had when she was composing such and such a poem or such and such uh, an email? Um, what's happening here uh, uh, doesn't, I should stress, for me anyway, devalue the power and meaning of those unique physical collections, quite the opposite. Uh, I think, uh, we used to say this is the BBC, and you see it in the music industry, all sorts of other areas, as, as people's lives, including their research lives, become more screen-based, the power and value of encountering physical objects grows, doesn't shrink. Uh, I'm afraid we just have to stay good at both of these, both of these things. But of course, what is happening there uh, among other things, is that those remarkable physical objects are transforming themselves into data and going on the journey that data can go on. Um, and that leads seamlessly to the next big theme, which, again, from uh, 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 in our LUK's configuration, uh, talks about the, um, uh, what we can do in terms of uh, data research management, tr taking data seriously. Uh, again, this was a bit of a journey of discovery for the BBC, which absolutely did not think it was in the data or data set business, um, until we realised that we were and that we were sitting upon mountains of data, important information that wasn't ordered properly, that wasn't searchable, wasn't you couldn't do much with it. Uh, and uh, to give one little instance from the BBC's experience, um, we discovered that, uh, maybe this is more of a special collection story actually, that, that we didn't even have a record of what we had broadcast. Uh, we actually had to digitize the historic pages of the Radio Times, <laughs> OCR them, and they're still working on this, turning it now into a colossal data set. So before, by the way, we privatized Radio Times, we did, we did this, we got the data back. Uh, so that, for posterity, we do finally have a digital record of what the BBC actually put on air. Um, but of course, again, in the media industry, and I'm sure it has analogues here as well, uh, uh, data is money, uh, data is power, uh, and uh, increasingly in the commercial sector, uh, um, commercial broadcasting is understanding that information, aggregated, disaggregated, uh, um, and its control uh, is of immense value. So I was fascinated 
to see the extent to which within the research community the vital importance of learning both to identify data, authenticate it, shape it, um, find it, use it, interpret it is being taken uh, as seriously as it should. It is clearly now at the heart of research and I should say the British Library is not itself, uh, although we will have large data sets and we will collect to a degree, um, we won't be collecting to the degree the big science organisations will and so on, but nonetheless I think we do have a role projects like data site and so on uh, in making sure that again anyone who wants to do research can find their way to the data sets um, they need to find and use and also there is an element of judgment validation authentication there's good and bad data out there and part of the skills in this room are to make sure that we're guiding people um, to where we think the data is strong and true and usable and indeed how to use it um, and I'm conscious that uh, uh, amid the many, many transformatory interventions happening across this sector at the moment, um, one I've not mentioned yet is next year's move for the legal deposit libraries to become non-print e-legal deposit libraries, uh, collecting e-books, e-journals, and so on. Um, most tantalizingly and fascinatingly within that, it is our our, our right initially, I suspect our obligation over time, um, to collect the UK web domain uh, as comprehensively as we can. It'll be partial or, or occasional to begin with. It'll grow and grow and grow. And uh, although that will not in its essence be the web as you see it, as it were, live on air, uh, it won't be dynamic in quite that way, uh, nonetheless a, over time, it will, of course, become a unique record because the web, wonderful as it is, is ephemeral. And nothing, nothing is guaranteed permanence on the web, and this is. But also, fascinatingly, and I only just be begin to understand this, it turns the UK web domain into a data set, <laughs> to a database that you can actually do research on in its entirety. Uh, and you can't do that just on the open web. Uh, we don't know what the implications of that. It may take scholars decades to truly, for it to be, acquire critical mass and become valuable, but I'm, I'm, I'm admiring of the long campaign it has taken to deliver a serious culture of collecting for the medium, which we all know, I begin with Twitter here, we all know is the true, lively, living, contested social record of our day. We need to get better, better and better at it. Um, it none of this is done by in almost any case by a single organization working alone, almost physically impossible. Uh, so uh, my fourth, I suppose, big theme uh, is around partnerships and the important, importance of partnerships. Uh, again, uh, this organization rightly talks about collaboration, uh, about improving quality, reducing costs. Uh, and again, said, uh, at the BBC, we learnt the hard way, but the good way, they're the same, actually. You, in other words, there's no easy way to do this, uh, that you make the really exciting things happen by lowering your guard a little, um, taking a risk, compromising things you thought were maybe a little bit precious in order to find an alignment with another partner, great organization, company, whatever it may be. There's joint ventures, they're hard to do, um, uh, but we began to do a lot of them uh, uh, in these latter years, and I think, I hope, that BBC will go on doing more. Um, one I was very closely involved with in the last, um, my last year at the BBC was uh, a project called The Space with Arts Council England, uh, which I hope some of you may have seen. It was set up for the Cultural Olympiad to provide a free, open public platform to capture, record, document and archive a lot of the arts events that happened uh, last summer. Uh, it's great, we're very, very proud of it, um, but it was un precedented for two organizations that were just differently wired uh, and although they had similar public purposes certainly weren't quite the same but um, through just sheer energy and, and commitment and goodwill and a lot of late nights we aligned them and that was harder than the technology I might say the technology is often easier it's the alignment of organizations uh, that is what creates the value and in that instance uh, Arts Council provided grants for content and commissioning, the BBC provided the technical expertise, uh, and it continues. Uh, it, it was an experiment, but it looks like it continues. 
at the library, boy, do they do partnerships. I, again, I, I knew this before I joined. We were in partnership with them. Uh, uh, but clearly, very important ones uh, in the area of historic uh, collections um, with, with uh, Microsoft originally Bibliolinks, the 19th century historical collections app on my iPad miraculously gives access to some 45,000 uh, digitized uh, uh, historic books. Uh, uh, a very substantive joint project with the Qatar Foundation that is digitizing and making available some half million pages uh, of documents from the East India Company uh, um, uh, and the India office, uh, as well as 25,000 uh, medieval Arabic manuscripts. Uh, and actually my favorite, I would say, of, uh, uh, in the historic area um, is uh, the emerging project with uh, Europeana, and it's not just them, it's 10 libraries across Europe, eight countries. I believe Oxford is involved with this, uh, certainly with JISC. Uh, and among other things, this is generating roadshows uh, in, in, in towns around the UK. There was one in Preston a few weeks ago um, where some 23,000 images, uh, letters, diaries, uh, uh, other objects, medals, and so on, were brought by people sort of antiques roadshow out of style, out of their houses, and many of them were selected for digitization to be put into the Europeana collection uh, uh, around 1914-18, around the First World War, uh, to be linked up to similar resources right across Europe. No one knows quite where this leads, but nonetheless, I think it's fair to predict that the, uh, um, the five-year exploration of 1914 uh, to 18 is likely to be a remarkable period of development in the joining up of institutions and collections, probably globally. It was a world war, uh, and it was the first historic event of its kind at which the audiovisual record is very strong, at which you know, cameras were really, really almost universally present. So suddenly you have almost the complete kit of parts in terms of multimedia research. Uh, and because of its significance, and luckily in a grim way because of its duration, we have time to get good at this uh, and, and build something uh, extraordinary together. Um, that takes us towards multimedia, and I guess within the, 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 the partnerships theme, the one other thing I might draw out that, that was obviously um, significant for me stepping into my new role um, was the work the library has been doing around uh, media generally, uh, uh, broadcasting, news content in particular, uh, on the news print side, many of you will be familiar um, with the work the library is doing with Bright Solid um, to digitize over 10 years some 40 million pages of historic newspapers. Um, uh, but uh, in parallel with that, um, the library has also opened up experimentally uh, a partnership with the BBC to give access to that complete, uh, by the way, digital record I was describing of BBC program history. Uh, but increasingly direct access to BBC audiovisual content programs through the, through the library. And the library is recording broadcast uh, uh, news media as well. Um, and with non-print legal deposit giving the capacity to capture the web incarnation of the news, we are beginning to realize that, that even in, in the digital space, we have the beginnings of the coming together of the print record, the web record, the broadcast record. We are the sound archive as well. And for researchers, I would hope of the not too distant future, we can begin now to get to a point where certainly for the last few decades, you can begin to research the social and political news record, topic by topic, person by person, event by event, and begin to get a feel of all the different flavors and different ways in which journalists and news media, uh, media captured it. Uh, huge challenge, we don't know how to bring that to life. But the potential of it is real, and it, it, and it cannot, if it's worth doing, it, it is absolutely not something that is worth doing in one reading room in London. In other words, this, is, this needs to be a resource uh, that we need to work together sector-wide and, and, and beyond uh, to make work. Um, uh, all of that depends, to some extent, on issues of copyright and rights holding. So the second to last inevitable big huge theme will always be rights. It certainly was uh, for us uh, at uh, the BBC. Um, and we were confronted with a, almost every single one of our rights agreements um, 
was written for an age of maybe one or two repeats on the radio or the telly, and that was it, and there was never any expectation uh, uh, this program would want to be used again, uh, for any purpose, actually. And uh, uh, so that, that was a challenge, given the, the, um, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the desire for, for massively increased um, access. And every inch of the way, and this has been a probably 10-year project, and it's continuing, uh, the BBC has tenaciously worked with rights holders to bring everyone on a journey into the potential of what digital media can and should do for the public, not in a naive way. Uh, the BBC is not in the business of shutting down commerce or shutting down people's proper reward, but it is, germane to some of the debates here, uh, in the business of ensuring that in return for a big injection of public money, there is a fair, powerful, uh, uh, free public offer uh, that comes out of that alongside other forms of, of remuneration. Um, the, 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 um, uh, the fact on iPlayer that you can watch programs free for seven days is sometimes the, the bit that's taken for granted. That was the single most difficult thing with iPlayer. The technology, the bit about actually getting the video to play and all the things to look nice and different, complicated, but in the end, that, that's a practical thing to do. The breakthrough was getting consensus among everyone, musicians, writers, performers, independent producers, Hollywood studios, and so on, that there could be that precious window for the public. Um, and as we then move to want to open up more liberal, reaching back beyond seven days into older archive content and so on. That is what's triggering uh, uh, um, a wholesale review again of all those agreements. This is something like 130 parallel framework agreements need constantly to be updated there. Um, but but it's, it's the legwork there that makes the profound difference. So I was very struck, RLUK talking about shaping, I think, ethical and effective publishing, in other words, those interventions you need to do to ensure that the way things are published uh, optimizes everything we want by way of a sustainable economy, both of, of making new things, but also ensuring they have value when they're broadcast, when they're published, that they actually achieve the impact, reach and reach the people they need to. Um, and uh, I wouldn't begin to attempt the, the, as it were, the, the direct reads across from one industry to, to another here, other than to say um, that that fundamental principle of balancing the needs on the one hand of creators um, with that of the public and the rights uh, and, and creators and rights holders with the general public uh, is a common thread here. Clearly, uh, even within, as it were, conventional business models, RLUK have done great work, collective negotiation to ensure the price, say, of journals is as, as fair as it can be. Um, tomorrow afternoon, you'll have Dame Janet Finch here and the, to a semi-outsider, fascinating journey <laughs> to a whole new model uh, uh, for publication around, uh, 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 as it were, publicly funded research or trust funded research. Uh, um, uh, fills me with great interest. I'm sorry I won't be here, but I do want to hear the feedback from how that, that all goes. But I would say certainly um, uh, already... Uh, even in the two months here uh, I've been here, I have become both impressed by and engaged with some of the, what looked to me like breakthrough interventions if the acts go through, coming out of Ian Hargreaves' work um, on rights uh, with the, the Enterprise and Regulatory Reform Bill, which I believe was in the House of Lords yesterday, and none of us seem to know exactly what happened. I'm sure it all went very, very well. But there's fundamental... Uh, uh, changes there around orphan works, as I'm sure you know, around collective licensing. This is vital stuff. We worried about this at the BBC. I worry about it here. Uh, and there's more to come. We need exceptions here for our industry uh, around uh, making copies for preservation sake, multiple backups. This is common sense. It must happen. Fair dealing, uh, I, I would say this coming from an audiovisual background, but the fair dealing for audiovisual material as, uh, as such as we have in print. Uh, um, this is, this is the nitty-gritty, it's really important, but it's what makes the difference in the end. And it's what allows the technological marvels, and they are marvels, to really mean something and, and to work. Because without them, um, there's no point in, in, in many of these digital interventions. So that's really, uh, that, I, I really only have one more uh, uh, theme 
to, uh, um, to mention. Uh, it is an important one, though. Uh, you, um, uh, 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 you, you touch in your strategy, uh, Janet, uh, uh, on uh, something quite visionary. I know you're going to be talking about here about redefining that research library model, in other words, in any corner, uh, any endeavor, when confronted with some of these changes, you know, you, 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 you sometimes have to confront existential questions, which are exciting, but you think, uh, you know, what, what are we really about, and wh where do we really make a difference? Uh, and clearly, uh, um, we know the internet and connected media and the world that we now swim in and increasingly are moving into presents an explosion of potential. It is global, it is connected. Uh, the, the, the researchers you work with, the institutions you sit within, are part of a bigger and bigger community, and we owe it to ourselves to join them up. Uh, and I would wholeheartedly, on behalf of the library, uh, support your objective uh, that, that says I think the UK should have the best research library support in the world. We are so well placed to do that, and we must do it. Um, but I would link it... Uh, finally, to one final theme for the BBC, which probably really is uh, for my the, the, the colleagues I care about desperately, as it were, back there now are, are struggling with, which is trust. Uh, the BBC is founded on trust. It will get back there. It's very, very strong. Um, what I'm very, very struck by, though, is in this area that the, the, the trust that you, as a professional community, we hope as a professional community have, uh, is the absolutely indissoluble asset that must be kept, uh, held on to through all of this. I was very struck by two, two little bits of completely different research. One, one I think it was Arts Council England um, looking at uh, um, uh, consumer views of the public library system uh, and just anecdotally observing the exceptionally high trust levels uh, that the general public repo repose in librarians. Uh, as sources of accurate information, as, as trustworthy sources of advice. That community uh, have something very precious. Uh, and a completely different uh, piece of research was also looking at the way um, today's uh, undergraduates, postgraduates maybe to a degree, increasingly resort to rely on secondary sources that they discover through search engines on the web because it's so quick and easy to do that and they're often sort of good enough. Uh, and in so doing, you begin, if you're not careful, to lose the discipline of always seeking out the primary source and going back uh, to the authentic first one. And I think looking at this, not just with domestically, but, but globally as a community, at a time when uh, um, uh, commercial search engines, quite right too, it's a free global economy, uh, thrive and grow. They do compete. Bing competes with Google and so on. But nonetheless, these are commercial entities doing brilliantly, but dominate the way information is discovered, coded sometimes, organized. Um, the counterbalance to that, um, the importance of research skills, resources, uh, a global community who believe uncompromisingly in authenticated, accurate, primary sources with proper metadata properly presented um, uh, and brought uh, uh, ever more easily and effectively to individuals uh, who want to do research is more important than ever. Uh, and stepping into this world, um, that challenge and some of the other ones I've talked about is what excites me most. But I'm going to leave it there. Thank you very much.